think that we can be able to move forward and be able to accomplish what we will. Say I say. Promotion to Tashinda. Promotion to Tashinda. Today, black people are experiencing a rising level of consciousness that is raising our self-concept. I am the good shepherd, the divine life, and the abundant life. I am the essence of divine love, forgiveness, and sacrifice. I am the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Forever and ever, I shape and I am. I believe that human society stands under the judgment of one God, revealed to all and known by many names. God's creative power is visible in the mysteries of the universe and the revolutionary Holy Spirit, which will not long permit men to endure injustice, nor to wear the shackles of bondage in the rage of the powerless when they struggle to be free. And in the violence and conflict, which even now threaten to level the hills and the mountains. I believe that Jesus, the Black Messiah, was a revolutionary leader sent by God to rebuild the Black nation Israel. To liberate African people from powerlessness and from the oppression, brutality, and exploitation of the white Gentile world. I believe, I believe, I believe that the revolutionary spirit of God embodied in the Black Messiah is born anew in each generation and that black Christian nationalists constitute the living remnants of God's chosen people in this day and are charged by God with responsibility for the liberation of African people. I believe, I believe, I believe that both my survival and my salvation depend upon my willingness to reject individualism. And so I commit my life to the liberation struggle of African people and accept the values, ethics, morals, and program of the Black nation defined by that struggle and taught by the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church. Yeah, the intro is 
Connected and stay connected online with the Shrine of the Black Madonna Virtual Village. Worship, join, learn, give, connect with us all in one place in just three easy steps. One, go to our landing page via our Linktree URL or QR code. Two, browse our selections and decide what you want to do and where you want to go. Three, Click on your choice and we'll take you right there. Yes, in just three easy steps, you can worship, join, learn, give, all in one place. So get connected and stay connected with us online at the Shrine of the Black Madonna Virtual Village. In the Bible, when Israel is crossing the River Jordan, out of the wilderness and into the promised land, it is the birth of a nation. This, mo this moment is the fulfillment of a dream that the people of Israel had held for hundreds of years. The Bible says that God rolled back the waters so that they could cross into the promised land on dry land. When the waters receded, God told Joshua to send some priests out into the dry riverbed to pick up some of the large stones made smooth over time by the river current to commemorate this momentous occasion. God ordered them to lay down some memorial stones so that they would always remember that God had brought them out of slavery in Egypt. The Bible is full of commands to remember a significant event or to commemorate a significant place so that they would always remember what God did there. People in all cultures and society commemorate the things that are important to them. These commemorations help people to remember who they are. They frame our identity. They reinforce group values and define what we are about. In other words, Societies manage memory. All societies have a collective social memory. This social memory is selective. It selects certain memories and organizes them into a narrative that presents that society in the best light. At the same time, it ignores other memories that reflect badly on that society. They call this process of excluding certain inconvenient truths from the national narrative, silencing the past. America is especially obsessed with silencing the past. The American national narrative is built on more lies than truths. 
American exceptionalism is a lie. White supremacy is a lie. The Declaration of Black Inferiority is a lie. American democracy is a lie. The Declaration of Independence is a lie. The Constitution is a lie. The National Anthem is a lie. The American motto, e pluribus unum, or out of many one, is a lie. The Pledge of Allegiance declaring that we are one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all, is a lie. Even the name, the United States of America, is a lie. I could go on and on, but you get the point. The average American is totally indoctrinated with all of this lying propaganda. In a society built on such a deep foundation of lies, the truth is very threatening. This is why there is such an intense, extreme, irrational hostility toward information that does not fit perfectly into the lying American narrative. For example, in 1973, Marlon Brando won the Oscar for his role in the movie The Godfather. Brando refused to accept the reward because he was protesting the portrayal of Native Americans in the movies. He didn't even show up. In his place, he had a female Native American activist named Sasheen Littlefeather accept his Oscar and make a speech about Hollywood's racist portrayal of her people. John Wayne, the favorite actor for white nationalist propaganda movies, had just announced Brando as the winner. He was walking off stage when Miss Littlefeather began her remarks. When he realized what she was saying, he went ballistic. John Wayne stomped back out to the podium to tear this little woman's head off. He had to be tackled and held down by several actors to keep this big white nationalist movie hero from attacking this little woman in front of the whole world. He was so offended by her criticism of America that he just couldn't control himself. This is the way white people in general act when confronted with truths that contradict the American national narrative. And this is why white, white people have turned woke into a derogatory term and go ballistic over critical race theory, even though they can't tell you what it is. This is why videos that show police killing unarmed black people inspire spontaneous GoFundMes that raise millions of dollars to support the murderous defenders of the lie. This is why some people just find just a simple term, Black Lives Matter, offensive. This is why white parents are in school board meetings threatening to kill the board members for teaching the truth. Trapped by their own lies, they are banning books, banning poems, banning speech, banning voting, and banning a woman's right to choose, all to preserve the lies undergirding white supremacy. Today, we are on the eve of our society's most venerated national commemoration the 4th of July holiday. The 4th of July commemoration is also, yep, you guessed it, rooted in lies. It is the result of a false narrative, a carefully fabricated story. This false narrative closed the American beginnings in the highest of ideals, liberty, justice, democracy, and freedom. This false narrative closed the American founding fathers in nobility, righteousness, and morality by portraying them as defenders of these high ideals. This false narrative also bestows upon the American founding fathers a mythic status and imbues them with divine wisdom and inspiration. 
White nationalist historians and legal scholars still interpret the intentions of the founding fathers like they hold the key to the revealed will of God. Our beloved founder wrote in his book, Black Christian Nationalism, two groups locked in conflict cannot possibly have the same truth. We need to, un so we need to understand something about the truth of the birth of this nation. We need to have some knowledge about the deep vein of hypocrisy that runs through American life when it comes to black people. And we need to know that the mythology surrounding America is deliberately made up and manufactured to hide that hypocrisy. American history has been sanitized, deodorized, homogenized, bleached, and whitewashed to hide terrible crimes against humanity and cast this society in the most positive light. So when we participate in these lying commemorations without really understanding what they represent, we give them power to shape our minds to shape our identities, to declare us inferior, to justify our mistreatment, to handicap our children, and to limit our possibilities. The 4th of July is also known as Independence Day, but it was anything but an Independence Day for black people. As a matter of fact, America's independence from England prolonged slavery almost 100 years and allowed for slavery to be expanded and intensified. So today I want to turn this lying commemoration on its head by helping us to understand the real truth behind, behind the founding of America. I want to make clear that the American Revolution was not fought to break the tyranny of King George. It was not about taxation without representation. It was not fought to establish a government of the people, by the people and for the people. And it certainly was not fought to establish freedom, justice, and equality for all. It was fought for one reason and one reason only, to preserve and expand slavery. For black people to grow up celebrating the 4th of July as a glorious Independence Day is like Jews celebrating Hitler's birthday as the second coming of the Jewish Messiah. The glorious American Revolution was really not a revolution at all. It was a counter revolution, a revolution against the revolution. The true revolution was the revolt of the enslaved Africans that had become so widespread throughout the Western Hemisphere. These violent revolts caused European countries engaged in the slave trade to question whether or not slavery was really worth all the trouble. Enslaved Africans were revolting from Canada to Brazil and everywhere in between. What has always been presented as a pretty easy process of domination where black people offered only meager resistance and were quick to accept slavery and soon turned into docile, happy slaves. It's one of the biggest lies that have ever been told. Actually, the institution of slavery required a long, terrible, bloody process involving centuries of conflict. Gerald Horn writes in his book, The Counter-Revolution of 1776, Slave Resistance and the Origins of the United States of America. There has been a desire to create an uplifting narrative to explain and undergird the fruits of 1776. The problem is this narrative serves to obscure the point that as July 4th, 1776 approached, Africans had been involved steadily in the poisoning, murdering, and immolating of white settlers, 
immolating. That means burning them up. Burn up the whole house. Burn everybody in it. The Western Hemisphere was a seething cauldron of tribal competition. Before the whiteness construct was created, European countries were mortal enemies to each other and had been so for thousands of years. The English, the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Germans, the Dutch, the Irish, the Italians, and the Swedes were all mortal enemies. So when the competition for colonizing territory in the New World began, it was like an arms race. All of the European countries were scrambling for control of lands in the New World, lusting for the riches they could provide so that they could defeat their enemies. Every side actively recruited enslaved Africans, the British, the French, the Spanish colonists, and even Native Americans enlisted Africans to fight against their European enemies. They promised them freedom. They gave them guns. This conflict made the whole hemisphere a battlefield of violence and mayhem. The enslaved Africans were also actively involved in their own revolution. And black people were never as docile in accepting a slavery as we have been led to believe. This is another lie. Enslaved black people were engaged in private acts of rebellion as well as collective acts of armed revolt. Privately, they shot, stabbed, strangled, poisoned, and burned up masters on a regular basis. Research has shown that many slave owners thought to have died from disease were actually poisoned by African women with knowledge of herbal poisons. Matthew C. Hurlbut writes in the Caroline Chronicles, for enslaved women tasked with domestic responsibilities, the nature of their work as cooks, wet nurses, and nannies put them in immediate proximity to the food consumed by their white masters and their offspring. Poisoning and infanticide gave some women the ability to resist by hitting white masters where it hurt most. Enslaved black people didn't just have these private revolts. They also had mass revolts that were suppressed and never taught in history. Like Gloucester County, Virginia, 1663, Bacon's Rebellion in 1676, the New York City Slave Rebellion of 1712, the Stono Rebellion of 1739, the New York Conspiracy of 1741, Gabriel Prosser of 1800, New Orleans 1811, Denmark Vesey 1822, and Nat Turner in 1831. But there are also hundreds of revolts that were intentionally hushed up to alleviate the fears of white people and to avoid inspiring more black people to, invoke, to revolt. The records of these revolts were later erased from history and forgotten as the victors told their own version of the truth. But the real truth is that the slave revolts were so frequent that the white population lived in a state of constant terror. There were stories and rumors of slave revolts coming in from all over the Western Hemisphere. Black sailors bought news of, a, of slave revolts throughout the diaspora. Many of the slave owners in the South had already been run out of the Caribbean. Seized with acute paranoia, they conveyed nerve-jangling, blood-curdling stories of slave revolts. They killed everybody. When the Haitian slave revolution defeated the French, the Spanish, and the British armies, it struck sheer terror in the slave owners. Without understanding this fear, it's impossible to understand the mindset shaping the cruel behavior of slave owners. Black people were never as docile and accepting of slavery as we have been led to believe. It's just another lie. 
In the beginning, white indentured servants weren't any better off than enslaved black people. So a lot of slave rebellions included poor white people fighting beside enslaved Africans in order to break up the cooperation between poor Europeans and enslaved Africans, the British, the British created the concept of whiteness. This removed all the class distinctions between British citizens and made all white people part of the ruling class. Then whiteness was extended to include all of their European enemies. The creation of whiteness included white people in one common racial grouping for the first time in history. This meant that they considered everybody outside the white group inferior and subhuman, excluded and undeserving. And enslaved Africans were declared by law to be property in perpetuity. As a result, Enslaved people escaped. They fled to the mountains and the swamps and established their own civilizations. They were called Maroons. These Maroon communities recreated their African existence in Jamaica, Cuba, Mexico, Brazil. In America, there were over 50 Maroon communities. There were Maroons along the Savannah River in South Carolina and Georgia. There was a maroon community of thousands in the dismal swamp outside of Wilmington, North Carolina. The number of maroons that escaped to Florida was so great that the state of Georgia was created to be a firewall, a buffer zone to protect the rich plantations of South Carolina from being invaded by black people. The maroons in Florida remained a major problem well into the 1800s. The fighting was so fierce and losses were so devastating that the government decided to keep these battles secret. They didn't call them slave revolts. They called them the Seminole Indian Wars to prevent the world from knowing that the army was really getting their butts kicked by escaped black people. Other enslaved black people escaped to join the Native American tribes. When the five great Native American nations of the South were defeated and marched to Oklahoma on the Trail of Tears, there were many Africans among the Indians. There were even regular revolts on board slave ships. There were revolts in the Caribbean islands that ran all the white people into the sea. Gerald Horn writes, it was in early 1736 that a conspiracy was exposed in Antigua for the enslaved to liquidate the European settlers. All the white inhabitants of this island were to be murdered and a new form of government to be established by the slaves among themselves. They were determined to possess the land entirely. This was preceded by yet another horrid plot in 1729, in which the enslaved were determined to cut off the head of every white inhabitant of Antigua. All along, there was resistance. It is not what we were told. What I'm trying to make clear here is that there were slave revolts Everywhere there were enslaved people. These revolts had the multiplying effect of inspiring other revolts. And this constant fighting and the stark fear that the white population lived with every day made all of the European nations wonder whether slavery was really worth it. So one by one, they abolished slavery and made it illegal. But when England began to consider ending slavery, the American colonies saw it as a mortal threat to their existence. So they decided to revolt against England. In America at this time, 
Slavery was not just a Southern thing. The biggest slave ports were in New York, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and South Carolina. Rhode Island had more slave ships than anybody because that's where they were made. I've seen profits were being made up to 1600% return on investment. That's $1,600 for every $1 invested. And the money that the, that the slave trade was generating was being used to build up New York and Boston, Philadelphia, Charleston, Hartford, and New Haven. Slave trade profits were laying the foundation of the Wall Street banks, the Ivy League schools, the insurance industry, and financed the Industrial Revolution. Slavery was so important to the American economy that without it, America would not even be possible. So the founding fathers decided to revolt against the anti-slavery revolution. The Declaration of Independence is full of high-minded rhetoric about freedom and democracy, but was really designed to preserve the right to impose slavery on black people. The 55 men that gathered to put together the Constitution were basically a cartel of slave owners. The biggest of them was George Washington, who owned more than 350 slaves. He was also a slave breeder. Thomas Jefferson, the principal architect of the Declaration of Independence, was also one of the biggest slave owners in the country with over 200 enslaved Africans. John Adams was another architect of the Declaration of Independence and became the second president of the United States. He made his living as a lawyer representing slave owners. John Hancock who was famously the first one to sign the Declaration of Independence, was one of the biggest slave owners in the North. Samuel Adams, whose beer is still popular, was one of the founding fathers and a major Northern slave owner. All of this is whitewashed, homogenized, disinfected, and deodorized with sweet smelling fairy tales about dignity, nobility, righteousness, justice, and never telling a lie. When the whole thing is a lie. And when we tell our children these fairy tales and mythologies about the founding of America, and they commemorate these lies, they walk through life blinded by scales that we have helped to place on their eyes. When we do that, we leave them naked and vulnerable to other interpretations. James Baldwin said, history is not the past, it is the present. We carry our history with us. We are our history. If we pretend otherwise, we are literally criminals. William Faulkner, the famous Southern author said, the past is never dead. It's not even past. Both of them are saying that our past is still living in us and ignoring it has negative consequences. You can't simply sweep the past under a rug and ignore it. It continues to be a factor influencing our lives every day. Black people who are not rooted in the past operate at a severe disadvantage. They suffer from cultural amnesia. They don't know who they are, so they can be told anything. They can be turned into mindless sickum dogs to do the bidding of their oppressor. We serve their interests. We fight in their wars. We cooperate with our oppression. We accept second-class citizenship. We teach our children to cooperate with their oppression. We make them rich and powerful while we remain poor and powerless. 
When we commemorate past events that celebrate a legacy of lies, our children grow up indoctrinated by white nationalist propaganda that shapes their identity, influences how they feel about themselves, and helps them justify their mistreatment by other people. When we fail to know the truth, we become co-conspirators in our own oppression. Black people in America are in a precarious situation. We live in a matrix of lies, a conspiracy of lies, but we're expected to live our lives as if these live our lives as if these lies are the truth. This is oppression. Oppression is a weight bearing down on you. Break the conspiracy of lies and the full weight of the white nationalist enemy system falls down upon your head. Ask Colin Kaepernick. Ask Billie Holiday. Ask Muhammad Ali. Ask John Carlos. Ask Jeremiah Wright. Ask Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. Ask Paul Robeson. Ask Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King. Ask any black person trying to survive in corporate America. Ask any educator teaching the truth. We're expected to sell our souls just to get along in an abusive relationship. Uncomfortable white people? We can't have that. So we live in a world where up is down and down is up. Where right is wrong and wrong is right. Where good is evil and evil is good. Where lies are the truth and the truth are lies. Where we are punished for seeking to live as full human beings and rewarded for being in words. Living like this is an affliction to the soul. No wonder many of us are depressed, alcoholic, drug addicted, schizophrenic, bipolar, homicidal, suicidal, or just plain crazy. And imposing these lies on innocent, trusting, and impressionable black children is to kill their spirits in the nest. That is cultural suicide. For our own health and welfare, we need to know that we did not come from people who just laid down, gave up, gave in, and accepted their oppression. We need to know that black people were not broken like horses and cooperated with slavery. Know the truth. And the truth will make you free, free to serve our own interests, free to meet our own needs, free to define ourselves, free to develop our own potential, free to raise our own children, free to control our own destiny, free to exercise our own inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we need to abandon our 4th of July celebrations. We need to celebrate, but we need to be clear what we are celebrating. What we are not celebrating is George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, the Boston Tea Party, or the racist national anthem. What we are not celebrating is the flag, the president, the military, or the police. What we are not celebrating is white people's concept of freedom, which is white people's freedom to exploit, exclude, and insurrect. What we are celebrating is our ancestors who were brought to this country naked and in chains and still made a way out of no way. We are celebrating our tradition of resistance and resilience against a system designed to strip us of everything and leave us dead. We are celebrating that after everything that we have gone through in this country, we have survived and become smarter, stronger, and more prosperous in every generation. We are celebrating that we don't need permission to be included. We are not guests or visitors, or stepchildren, or second-class citizens, or hired hands. We are stakeholders 
Nobody can tell us that we can't go in the refrigerator. We bought the refrigerator. We bought the food in the refrigerator. We pay the electricity to run the refrigerator. We even built the company that manufactured the refrigerator. We don't have to wait for anybody to open the doors for us. We built the doors and we need to learn to act like it. So when you eat your barbecue or drink your beer or watch the fireworks or watch any old John Wayne white nationalist propaganda movies on Turner Classic Movies. Remember that we came here before the Mayflower and 157 years before America was founded. Remember that we have poured our blood, sweat, tears, and creative energy into this country and it is ours as much as it is anybody's. Remember, nobody in the history of this country ever gave us anything. We've had to fight for everything we have and we're going to have to fight for everything we want. And remember that God and our ancestors have been with us all the way, helping us to make a way out of no way, encouraging us when we were down, guiding us when we were lost, and inspiring us to keep on Keep it on. On this 4th of July, remember our own black story and celebrate that. Know the truth and the truth will make you free. Amen. And I say. Shine bright, shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world, and we will walk in the light of beauty.